Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here, and welcome back to another episode. Today, we are going to be stepping into the meat science world. So we are visiting with Brianna Boozman. And Brianna is a meat scientist for Marble Technologies, which is a company focused on bringing automation to the meat industry. Brianna attended South Dakota State University and received degrees in animal science and agriculture business before going to the University of Idaho for her master's in meat science. Prior to working with Marble, she worked as an assistant professor in the meat science group at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which is actually where I got to meet Brianna and became friends with her. So I'm super excited to bring this episode to you today and to be talking about some of the advancements that are happening with technology and the packing plant side. Um, But before we dive into that, I do just want to remind you guys that if you are more of a YouTube person, you can 100% check out all these episodes on YouTube as well. So be sure to follow, like, review, and subscribe on your favorite listening app. With that, let's chat with Brianna. Hey folks, have I told you about my favorite app to manage all of the data for our cow herd? We made the switch to Breeder and it has saved us hours. From basic inventory management, calving records, treatments, reminders, weights, running reports, and exploring different marketing avenues for your calves, Breeder has you covered. One of the best parts is they also work with multiple supply chains so they can offer another marketing outlet for your cattle. We can then choose to get carcass data back through the Breeder app. This will help inform our breeding choices for next year and also prove and improve the quality of beef we're ultimately producing. I think Breeder is going to be a game changer for producers like us, and I'm excited for you to check it out. To learn more, head to Breeder.co. That's B-R-E-E-D-R dot C-O. And the link is in the show notes. All right, Brianna. Well, this is a lot of fun because, first of all, I haven't talked to you in a long time. And second of all, I you've kind of been on the, my list for a while here to talk a little bit about what you're doing. Um, not directly cow-calf focused today, but in the long game, a little bit. So I'm excited to talk about what you're doing with Meat Science. Uh, the listeners already got to hear your bio and a little bit about you and how we met. So to start things off, I'd really like to hear why you are passionate about meat science. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Well, thank you, Shay, for having me on here. Um, It's always exciting to be able to be part of these kinds of things. But uh, how I got into meat science, it it was a little bit of a a journey, honestly, and what got me into it and passionate about it. Um, So I I grew up on a farm in southeastern South Dakota. My family has a cow-calf operation there. And was very involved in it growing up, Uh, but I knew that long-term I wanted to be active in the ag industry, but not necessarily be directly farming. And so I went on to school at South Dakota State University and got a double major in ag business and animal science. And through those programs, I had the opportunity to take a meat science class and ended up taking uh, multiple meat science courses for my kind of production credits. And what really got me excited about meat science as an undergrad is in all these different animal science classes and ag business classes, whether it was uh, genetics or nutrition um, or even into some of the economics things, all of those things end up tying together in meat science. So the entire life of the animal uh, from the dam's health before the animal's even born uh, going into... Uh, its entire life and production into processing, and then even how it's cooked, all of those steps can impact that final product. And uh, what also kind of got me excited about it was during college, I had the opportunity to do some public relations internships for the ag industry. And a lot of people in the world, their interaction with the beef industry is getting a cheeseburger or buying a steak. Uh, to grill at home. And so to me, meat science was such an awesome way to be able to connect with people about the egg industry um, and to communicate, you know, what we do in the industry to be able to provide them a high quality product. Uh, so following South Dakota State, I went on to University of Idaho and got a master's degree in meat science. I 
my research out there was focused on steak tenderness and enzymatic uh, aging. And uh, following that, worked at University of Nebraska for a couple years, which is where you and I met, and uh, then moved to Marvel Technologies just over two years ago, uh, where I work as the meat processing specialist for Marvel. Yeah, well, meat sciences definitely almost serves as that, can really serve as that bridge between what ranchers are doing and what the consumer experiences. So very important part of the production process and really beef supply chain that sometimes we forget about as ranchers and we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's one of those things like, you know, my school didn't have an FFA program when I was a kid. I had no introduction to meat science. Um, you know, I would go with my dad to the locker to pick up the cattle that we would bring in for our family but didn't really even know it was a thing until I went to college and let alone how huge of an industry uh, it actually is. So it's an exciting place to be for sure. So on that note, why in your mind, why is it important for cattlemen and women to know what is happening current events wise and just stay up to date on what is happening in the meat science world? Yeah, well, I think a big part of it ties in, you know, as, as we said, the product or the the burger, the steak, the roast, that's what consumers see of the meat industry. Um, people maybe in a city will follow a farmer influencer on social media and they see some of the production that way. But the average person doesn't have a whole lot of connection with, you know, how cattle or how hogs are being raised. Uh, but they do have that connection to the actual protein. And so I think just kind of keeping up to date with those things that are happening. Um, you know, it can provide a sense, I guess, on what consumers are actually feeling about the industry. Um, and it, I mean, ends up tying back to production and to uh, how it's going to impact the product that folks are raising. Absolutely. We don't put all that work in on the front end for it to not, that same amount of work to not be put in on the final steps too. Mm -hmm. So talk a Absolutely. little bit about what Marble Technologies is and a little bit more about what your company and your team is doing. Yeah, absolutely. So as the name says, Marble Technologies is a technology company, uh, but we are focused in the meat industry. So bringing automation uh, to the meat world, uh, focusing mainly on beef, also some in pork and uh the big thing that we're working on right now is the area called pack off in a in a beef plant. So uh, the majority of the beef in the United States gets shipped out of packing plants as boxed beef. So if you go to Costco or Fairway, you'll see these big uh, primals, subprimals, packaged meat products that are packaged in a vacuum sealed bag. So at the plant, um, there are in an average plant probably 15 to 25 people who their job all day long is looking for their one meat cut. They take it off of a conveyor. It's been vacuum sealed. They put it in a box. They fill a box, push that heavy box onto the line to get weighed and go into inventory. So to give you an example of that, um, I get to spend a lot of time in meat packing plants and get to visit with a lot of the operators. And was in one um, and got talking to a guy on the line and he had worked in that facility for over 20 years, always in pack off, and he was responsible for boxing the clods. So big shoulder portion where the flat iron comes from, lots of roasts come from there. Um, and that piece that he packed every day was about 18 to 25 pounds. This facility did about 2,500 head of cattle per day. So two of those for animals. So he was boxing close to 5,000 pieces every day. And that one guy... Uh, would box every year over 18 million pounds of beef, which is roughly enough to feed the population of Orlando, Florida, or over 330,000 people. So very, very labor intensive, as is the rest of production in a meat plant. Uh, but we're focusing on that area to both help limit the amount of labor that is needed there uh, for the folks that are there still working, making the job easier, um, making it more ergonomic for them to be able to do, as well as adding value to those products, um, being able to get 
data on the pieces that are coming through, uh, get information to the plant as to what they're actually producing every day. And so all of these things can lead to, to value in production. And so we do that uh, through using computer vision technology, so cameras that do cut identification. Um, we build really awesome hardware. It's pretty incredible to see. Um, and then use software kind of to combine the two. So identifies the cut, tells it where to be sorted, brings it directly to the operator uh, to get it into a box. So it's not necessarily eliminating positions or the specific technology. It's more so making it easier easier and a more favorable job for that individual. Yeah, kind of a combination. Uh, the, the goal would be to have less people who are needed in that specific area of the plant. So ideally, if you have 15 there now, hopefully you could do the job with seven or eight. However, uh, often when I tell people I work in a in a company that's doing automation or helping with labor, that sort of thing, I hear things like, you know, you're taking away jobs or, or this or that. But the fact of the matter is, just like uh, a lot of farms that you go to who are trying to find work, it's difficult to, to get consistent, reliable labor at these facilities. Mm -hmm. So the average packing plant is running many, many people short every shift. Um, and so a lot of the people who maybe are in that position right now of just putting meat in a box would be able to get an upgraded position to something that's giving them more value, giving the plant more value, um, and really helping that process along even further. Hey folks, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I love the Red Angus breed. And if you want to boost your cattle profitability, choose Red Angus. It's celebrated as the beef industry's most favored female. Red Angus registrations have surged by 24% over the past decade with docile temperaments and environmental resilience. These cattle are not only easy to handle, but thrive in various conditions. Their premium carcass quality and exceptional maternal traits make them a valuable addition to any herd. Elevate your operation today with Red Angus. After you finish this podcast, listen to the Red Angus Remarks podcast to learn why Red Angus is the most favored female. So then um, I just a few episodes back, I had like the Cattleman's Heritage people on to talk about and they talked about how much more efficient they're going to be. And so I'm curious, are you working and maybe it's not with them, maybe it's with other smaller or more moderate sized plants that are popping up. Are you guys helping work with those new operations to be set up to be more efficient from the get-go or are you mostly working on plants that are already pretty established? Yeah, so some of those, you know, we've had maybe some conversations with to start, but our current customers are facilities that are uh, in production. So that is one type of automation that you're working with. Are there other automations or technologies that you're excited about and want to touch on? Yeah, so uh, at Marble, our main one is that that pack offline. With that, we also do box verification. So um, most of the automation that you see coming into packing plants is either focused on uh, labor or process efficiency, uh, product quality, or food safety. And so one of the things for product quality and process efficiency is making sure that the right products are getting into the box. And so we also do some tech in terms of box verification. So before it's sealed, we take a picture of the box. We say what's in the box. We give a plant kind of an insight into what is there. So that way, if they get claims from customers down the line, they can see what was actually shipped out to them. Um, so that's kind of the things that are happening at Marble. Outside of that, though, um, you know, the beef industry for a very long time, you know, the product has changed, but the process of actually getting the product from live animal to carcass to shipping it out has looked very, very similar. Still extremely manual, um, but we're coming into a time where technology is maturing. Uh, and I guess the best way to describe that is when I think about listening to music right now most most of the time I listen to music on my phone I'd pull up Spotify but there was never a time that we could have just jumped from listening to music on the radio to directly having it in our hand and able to carry it around we had to first go through 
every version of an MP3 player, the iPod, etc., to get to have it on your phone. When it comes to the meat industry, we can't just go from only knife and hook to suddenly everything is automated robotics here and there. Um, but so much of this technology is now being utilized in other industries. Um, it's being proven in other industries, and it's really building kind of that gateway into bringing it more and more into food production. And there's other areas, other other types of industries, even within food production, that use automation. And so it's pretty exciting seeing it coming into the meat world. Um, a lot of it started with pork and poultry. If you go into those facilities, there's a lot more automation currently seen. But that's a lot more consistent product, uh, similar genetics, similar feeding environments, similar product. Whereas if you go into a beef plant, it could be a 800-pound carcass right next to a 1,200-pound carcass. And that really changes how it needs to be processed. Um, so I think lots of opportunity for automation to come in and will be exciting to see what it looks like over the next five, 10 years. So outside of other protein industries that are using this technology, are there other industries outside of agriculture that you're modeling some of this technology after? Uh, so we're Marvel specifically focused on the meat industry, but I mean, we have, so I guess a little background on our company. So we have an office in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, we also have an office in Boston, and that's where our computer vision and uh, software engineers, or the majority of them, are based out there. And so with that, uh, in Boston, there's a lot of different kind of tech things happening. And so um, even our guys that work on our team came from, you know, backgrounds in uh, security, uh, also in different like egg marketing type things. And so it's maybe not directly taking like OTSA oh, technology and putting it into the meat industry, but you can take concepts from those other industries and say, this is how it worked here. This is a problem that we had here, how we solved it, and now taking it into our industry. Um, outside of our software team, we, we have other engineers on the mechanical side that have worked also in different uh, aspects of the food industry. Basically, what I'm trying to say is we have such a wide variety of backgrounds that we can take basically everything that we've learned in those industries and apply it to the meat industry, even though we aren't necessarily trying to replicate what was happening there. Absolutely. So you talked already about how one of the big impacts this is going to have is labor. Plants are already running short on employees they can't get enough help like other segments of agriculture and this is going to aid in that what other long-term impacts do you see coming as automation continues to improve well so i kind of mentioned before but a lot of the automation that comes in it's either process efficiency so labor or food safety and quality and um when we talk about the beef industry specifically in my mind, there might be other meat scientists who disagree with this, but meat quality isn't a huge concern at this point anymore, um, regardless really of the grade. Tenderness has been knocked out. We have really, really high quality cattle in the U.S. Um, overall, eating experience of beef in the United States is very high. Uh, things though, that can always be improved is food safety and uh, not just the safety of the product short term, but even thinking about things extending shelf life. Um, one of the kind of trends in food industry, and I mean, it's something I care a lot about, is food waste and ex being able to extend shelf life of product, that sort of thing. Um, all of those things, even the way down to the way that it's packaged, are forms of technology. And so even some tests that, you know, I see when I go into plants or companies we've worked with of looking at what type of plastic bag and what uh, type of temperature is in the room, all of those things can impact that final product, the quality of the product, and how long it's going to last and be good for for a consumer. And so to me, the food safety side, I think will be really interesting to see if that continues on. Um, and then also just maximizing the product that's coming in. So uh, really being more efficient in the process, 
cutting the the carcass in the best way to get the most value for the products that it's getting um all of those things it's kind of a wide open door of of what could be coming do you want to talk a little bit more about maybe some changes that might be coming on the food safety side or anything more specific as far as extending shelf life or food waste in general yeah so on that i guess that's not anything that marble is working on um but even just from the, the reason that this actually got really into my head today is I'm on a thesis committee for a grad student, and a lot of it is focused on using freezing, thawing techniques for tenderness. But also using those techniques can impact what that final product tastes like, how safe it is to consume, the temperature that you're holding it at, etc. Um, and when it comes to food safety, it isn't just like the the microbes, bacteria, E. coli, salmonella, all of those things that impact food safety. Um, but a technology that's used in every single packing plant that you go into is x-ray. And so on the beef side, some box beef goes through it, all ground beef goes through it uh, to look for any foreign contaminants. So we might not think about it, but that's a huge, huge food safety concern. Uh, the number one physical contaminant that's found in beef is buckshot. And if you have a consumer who gets a burger at Wendy's and ends up with buckshot in it, that's a huge food safety concern. It's a huge industry concern. It's a quality concern, all of those things. Um, and so there's already these steps that are being put into place to ensure that the product that's getting out the door is is safe and it's good for consumers to eat. Uh, but I just see that kind of continuing on. So... This question it just kind of popped into my mind when you were talking about packaging earlier. You see other companies pushing towards, you know, the sustainable route. I'm using quotes here for people who are listening. And so maybe they're not using plastic. Maybe it's more recyclable material or something like that because there's a lot of push for these Gen Z consumers who are really focused on sustainable, what's better for the environment, all of that jazz. Are you seeing any of those changes or shifts being made on a broader scale? Nothing to the effect, like, I mean, everywhere you go, sustainability, every company now has like a sustainability board, but nothing, I guess, that I can comment on a lot that would be much of an impact, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. I, no, and that's fine. I just, I'm curious about it because like, that's, something that I see yeah. being a Gen Z, like I myself am even conscious about stuff where you hear people, yeah. you know, was it California tried to eliminate single use plastic bags or stuff yeah, like you that? Go, I mean, you go to California and you have to pay a 10 cent fee for if you use a plastic bag at Walmart. I When I was out there recently, I bought some big jugs of water and had a 10 cent fee for them being in a plastic container. And so... I guess on that, I think there's things that are be, being looked at that might seem like a small decision but could make a big impact. So on like the bags, every piece of meat is a different size. Mm -hmm. uh, and so even working with uh, the operators in that area to make sure that they're using the right size bag for the product so they're not having all this excess waste, those kinds of changes are being made Um but I, yeah, I don't have a lot, I don't think, on that of what I guess I have seen when in there. Yeah, that's fine. So, Brianna, when you think about the future of meat science, what are you excited about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, one, if you would have ever told me when I was in high school that I was going to work in meat science, I wouldn't have believed it. But even once I got into the meat industry not that long ago, uh, the thought of working at a tech company in meat science definitely wasn't on my radar. And it's been pretty amazing in the last two years to see the technology that Marble has done, but also just to see um, kind of the the push for automation in the industry um, and the really acceptance that has been coming with it from uh, folks who are working at these facilities. And so to me, what's really exciting is just thinking about, you know, in two years, 
the difference that I've seen, what is that going to look like in five years, in 10 years? Um, and what are these things going to do to help improve the product that's getting out the door? Um, how is it going to improve, again, food safety, quality, consistency of the product that customers are getting? Because all of those things end up impacting the eating experience. They impact consumers' perception and they can help drive demand for beef uh, just based on, you know, how it is being processed at the facility. And so I'm I'm pretty excited just to see, you know, where could this possibly go as uh, something that I just a couple of years ago never would have thought really to even be possible, let alone being being active in the facilities now. Well, awesome. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share? I don't think so. I appreciate you having me on here. I know, as you said, it's the meat side of things may not typically be the the topic for like cow-calf producers and that sort of thing. But, you know, in the end, it all kind of does tie back to that. And, you know, it's something that even as being somebody in the meat industry, I care a lot about the live side of production because um, it's been a huge, huge part of my life. And again, to feed the industry that I'm in, we need the live side of production. And so I pr just appreciate you having me on. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to visit with me about all things marble and catch up a little bit off the recording. So folks, if you want to learn more about marble technologies, I will put that link in the show notes. And in addition to that, always remember the best way to support this podcast and all your and all your favorite podcast is to rate, review the show, and share it with a friend. Happy ranching, folks.